We're just, recording. Just notebook paper for you there, in case anybody wants to take notes. But if they don't, no big deal. I won't be offended. I don't know. Okay, so I need to wrap this up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is going to be my feeble attempt of wrapping this up. Um, Thank you. So, I got some thoughts here. We'll see how they take. Anyway. Um, Brought my own. Yeah, I got some pictures to show too. <clears throat> as long as Phil's battery holds up. Um, it's just me and Speedo, so it's not big deal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I got some pictures of me and what I'll say. <clears throat> no, I'm just kidding. But I do have some pictures. Anyway, <clears throat> so if you recall way back when, whenever this thing started, um, many moons ago, uh, when, when Exodus starts, and if you remember from chapter one, we're basically been we were basically given a problem, and that problem in chapter one is disclosed, and it is the issue of Israel's slavery. So immediately when we start reading the book of Exodus, we're faced we're shown a problem, and that problem is slavery. So problem equals slavery, um, and that's how Exodus opens up. Um, and one of the things that I want to I'm just going to read for you really really quickly. Um, or a couple of verses out of Exodus chapter 1 because I'm going to um, pull out a specific statement. So Exodus chapter 1, beginning at verse 8 actually. Now, <clears throat> now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to oppress them. With forced labor, they built supply cities. So I'm going to talk about that phrase here in a second. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. So again, that's the problem that if we are we are we are shown when Exodus starts, and the problem is slavery. And specifically, they are called out in verse uh, eleven of chapter one. They are building the supply cities of Pharaoh. Now, um, the Hebrew word for supply cities is are mishkanot. Now, the reason I tell you that is because this is going to become important here in a few minutes. Um, but it's mishkanot, and that's the Hebrew word for store cities. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind. Now, as the book unfolds, we realize that we are also given a solution to the problem. And the solution to this problem of slavery is manifested in the person of Moses, and specifically the act that he is going to orchestrate. Actually, God is going to orchestrate through him. And that is the event of the Exodus. Okay? So um, we're given a solution, we're, quick, or we're given a problem immediately, we're very quickly uh, given a solution to the problem, and that's the Exodus as an event. Now, as I've talked about throughout the weeks, uh, throughout these past weeks, it's important that we see and understand Exodus not as a one-time event, but rather a long process. Remember, Moses shows up back, up, you know, Moses has an encounter with God, and then he goes back to Egypt. And we all know from the chapters as we read about Moses' encounters with Pharaoh, and they were numerous encounters. You know, Moses doesn't just walk up there, give, give Pharaoh one, one sign, and then Pharaoh says, okay, you got me, go ahead and go. No, it's this long, drawn-out process that continues to get more and more and more severe, and ultimately, Pharaoh's entire worldview and the Egyptian worldview kind of caves in on itself. I've talked about this, and that's really what the plagues are about. It's about destroying the Egyptian worldview and their, and, their, and their kind of customary way of, of viewing things and those types of stuff. So, <clears throat> ultimately, <clears throat> though, the, the result is fairly straightforward. The, uh, the plagues work, uh, particularly the plague of the firstborn, kills every, uh, all the firstborns, and ultimately, Israel is allowed to flee, and they go straight to Sinai. Um, and according to chapter 3, Sinai is the necessary pit stop on the way. And that's where at Sinai I talked about the, you know the, the dreaded defining relationship talk that we always had when we were in high school, you know the DTR as we called it, you know. Well, what do you think of me? Well, this is what I think of you. 
well, do you think the same? It's terrible. You know, it was really awkward. We all hated it, but we all had to do it with every relationship we're in. I kind of like to think of Sinai as the define the relationship moment, where Israel kind of got to the mountain and they kind of looked at God and they say, okay, what do you think of me? And God's like, well, this is what I think. What do you think? Are you ready? And so this, this back and forth banter goes on. And it's really Israel's in a lot of ways. It is Israel's define your relationship moment. And they figure out, okay, what's this God going to be about? And this is where the covenant is given to Israel. And the covenant is the ideal on which the Israelite way of life is going to be ordered. <clears throat> but after the covenant, that's only half the book, remember? We go through all of that. Exodus has an event, all the miracles, crossing of the Sea of Reeds, the Egyptian army is overrun the sea, and they're, and they're drowned on the seashore. Um, Israel realizes who they're following, and they grow to fear the Lord, and they trust Moses. They go through a wilderness time where they start grumbling, but ultimately they get to Sinai. That's half the book. All that, that's half the book. The second half of Exodus is all about the tabernacle. Beginning in chapter 25, we start to read about the plans to build the tabernacle. And folks, these are boring chapters, okay? These are hard to read because it's quite literally, you're going to get some acacia wood and you're going to build me a box that's this dimension by this dimension. Then you're going to get a bunch of gold and you're gonna melt that gold down and then you're gonna overlay this box. Oh yeah, and we're gonna call that the Ark of the Covenant, okay? And then we're gonna build a lampstand, okay? And it's gonna be called the menorah and it's gonna have these things and you're gonna, you're gonna fashion it this way. And then you're gonna build a table. Because on that table is where the sacrificial bread goes. Oh, and speaking of sacrifices, this is how you sacrifice a bull. So it goes on and on and on. That's the second half of the book of Exodus. Okay? That's when things really get slow, but they're very, very important. And sandwiched in between there, we have the golden calf episode. We talked about that last time. We and that's kind of like the interlude where everything just kind of goes haywire. Aaron kind of looks like a buffoon. Uh, I don't know what happened. I just threw a bunch of gold in the furnace and mm -hmm. out pops a cow. I, I don't know. So, and then after the golden calf episode, beginning in chapter 35 to the rest of the book, all those plans that we talked about in chapter 25 through 31, guess what? We regurgitate them all because we're building the tabernacle now. Okay? That's the second half of the book. All about the tabernacle. The Hebrew word for tabernacle is mishkan. So remember what I said at the very beginning, the Hebrews were building store cities, Mishkanot. Now they are building the tabernacle, Mishkan, Mishkanot, Mishkan, Mishkanot, Mishkan. There's a connection there. There's an audible connection there that the writer wants you to pick up on. Israel started out building store cities for the greatest empire in the world. They were, they were, they were freed from that and ultimately they find themselves building a tabernacle, a mishkan, for the greatest God in all the world, actually the only God in the world. Um, so there's this neat little audible connection that's going on throughout Exodus that really kind of ties everything together. But the second half of the book of Exodus is all about the tabernacle, which begs the question, why is the tabernacle so important? So this is, kind of I, this is kind of how I want to wrap everything up. Because the second half of the book of Exodus is all about the tabernacle, we need to kind of give some thought to why is this thing really important. Okay? So somebody open up your Bible um, to Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, and just read that. Verse 8? Yeah, just verse 8. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Simple enough. Why is the tabernacle important? The tabernacle will be God's sanctuary, and in that sanctuary, he will dwell among the Israelites. And have them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. The tabernacle is important because it represents God Almighty's earthly dwelling place. This is not... Exodus makes very, very clear that the reason why we are going to such great lengths to tell you about how to build this thing, and then you're going to build this thing, the reason why we emphasize this, and we take an entire half of the book talking about it, is because you need to realize the significance that God Almighty, the God who saved you out of Egypt, the God who you encountered at Sinai, is not just going to stay up in the heavens somewhere. 
No, he is going to take his dwelling place and he is going to come down and live amongst you. That right there is the reason, the foundational reason, why this tabernacle is, is so, so important. Uh, another reason is um, uh, the idea of the tabernacle, the actual layout of the tabernacle, and this is where I want to get the pictures out. Um, the, um, the layout of the tabernacle, the floor plan, if you will, actually resembles throne rooms in the ancient Near East. So God is actually viewed as not just, a, just not some deity, but rather he is considered to be a, um, a royal figure. They see God in, in terms of king, uh, the, the, the cosmic king. So let me show you some pictures here. If I can get this thing to... The Nazis were trying to find what? The Ark. Yeah. The Covenant. And uh, oh. fortunately for us, uh, this archaeologist uh, named Jones, Dr. Jones, <laughs> he stopped him. Indian Jones? Huh? Indian Jones? <laughs> oh, that's a little racist, lady. That's what somebody called Indian Jones. Indian Jones. <laughs> should pause the video. Oh no, we're recording it all. <laughs> are we still <laughs> recording? Are we sure? I just want the pictures to show up. There you go. Andy. I wanted to see, show you guys what the tabernacle looked like. I would love to know what the tabernacle looked like. Feel. Maybe Dan and Alicia could do a little number in the <laughs> intermission here. <laughs> well, while we're working on this, uh, I'm trying to arrange a field trip to the group if anyone's interested to a uh, church to Kentucky church. I found one in London, Kentucky. Anybody wants to go visit? What? I feel like this is a snake handling <laughs> joke. <laughs> it's not a joke. <laughs> it is a snake handling. You found one in London, no seriously. My mom is located one in London. Yeah, so. he was saying, Dave, you should go. I know, my brother's been in a couple of pictures. I want the pictures on my PowerPoint, on the here. And I would go if I weren't, like, you want to step in the afraid oh, that right. I, I couldn't get out. <laughs> oh, trust me. Yeah, you can get out. You're okay, buddy. Have you been to one? I feel okay. like it's not a responsible motherly right. thing to do. I'm, no. I'm pretty sure <laughs> they, they, they never came up a long time, but they know it's a one. And we left. Before they got them out? But when business started picking up, <laughs> they started packing out. Oh, I've seen some of those videos of um, the, I guess it was the guy that died, the cootie. Yeah. The one in the show, the TV show? Well, was, was he, was he the one on the show? Uh, okay. Kind of snakes are there. Was that the snake the, salvation? Uh, rattle snakes. Copper heads and uh, timber rattles. There's rattles, rattles. yeah. Water moccasins. Ugh. Sounds good time. Mm -hmm. I'm well, sure we're going to read the kids. I know, I know Dan. What's that? What's that? What's that, Dan? Field trip to a snake handling church. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I got the four. Boys go. I think she's like, okay, guys, no yeah, yeah, you all have to the If I believe enough, can I try? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you can. Make sure you, uh, you, might, you might turn the TV off back on. I wonder if they do have oh, the projector at work once in a while and just remove it. Okay, so here's the picture. You guys want to cuddle around? Okay, so here's what the tabernacle looked like. Okay, so this is kind of this is this is the dwelling place of the deity. This is where God says His presence dwells. Okay, so that's like the. What is, is this a touch screen? What's that? Is this a touch screen? Oh, wow, so fancy. Um, so this is this is 
<laughs> this is the um, this is the this is the uh, the house, if you will, of, of of God Almighty, and this is the courtyard. So when you talk about the courtyard of the tabernacle, everything that goes on in there, sacrificial um, tables and stuff like that, uh, and then this is the uh, the boundary thing that they talk about. Um, so that's kind of what the tabernacle is. Way in the back, number one, it's the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant, which is number two, sat. And that's kind of where God's throne was supposed to be. There's a curtain in front of it. Right? Yeah, and number three is a curtain in front of it. Okay? And then that in there is like where the, the menorah, the lampstand was. There was a table in there. And that's where the priests went. And only one time a year they would go all the way to the back. They did that on the Day of Atonement. With a rope attached to their leg and a veil. You know, that is a... That's a Jewish... That's a Jewish um, kind of... That's not in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. It's not? I thought no, it was in the Bible. Not. It's, it's, you, hmm. Why have we always heard that so much? Because it's a popular. Oh. But it's not. Um, and so uh, this is the size of the football field. And then the tabernacle courtyard included was basically a third of it. Mm. So that kind of gives you a scale how big it was. And then you guys, you guys talk about, or you remember reading about where the, um, the uh, tribes would kind of encamp around it when they would set camp. They would kind of, the tabernacle was in the middle. This kind of gives you an idea of what it looked like. This is where they all were. And then this is just kind of a schematic on how close quarters it would be. So that's kind of what the tabernacle looked like. Now, if you look at the, if you look at the throne, if you look at the footprint of this, if you actually look at the footprint, that actually resembles the, ah, I think I the battery, the battery. The battery just went dead. Oh. Um, that footprint of the actual sanctuary resembles what um, palaces look like in the ancient Near East, and we know that from archaeology and those types of things. So, so God is seen particularly as a royal figure as well. So, um, you know, it's 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 very reasonable to call God. You know, when you hear people talk about God being the king of the world, king of the cosmos, it's, it's I mean, it's it's rooted in this type of symbolism and those types of things. So, the reason why the tabernacle is important again. It was the earthly throne for the, um, for the cosmic king. And in terms of Israel, this cosmic king had a special, intimate relationship with Israel. Okay, so think about that for a second. The cosmic king had a special relationship with Israel. And this tabernacle was going to be God's dwelling place. Literally, quite literally, it's going to be his house. And that is what is associated, that idea is associated with the tabernacle. It later becomes associated with the temple. Because what the temple is, is a more permanent dwelling place for God Almighty. So they have the tabernacle as they're wandering around in the wilderness, but once Israel becomes a country, once they become solidified, Solomon's, uh, you know, David's throne, Solomon gets in there and he builds a temple. The tabernacle and the temple are closely related, the temple just being kind of a more permanent dwelling place. Um, so that's what that is. Um, and we also know that the tabernacle associated with the tabernacle Part of Exodus, most of Leviticus, parts of Numbers also show us that this place, this divine dwelling place, is also the place where the religion, the, the, the religious rites take place. This is where Israel comes to um, uh, uh, maintain their relationship with God Almighty. When things are out of balance, this is where they go to bring, back, to bring the thing back into balance through the sacrificial system. Burnt offerings, peace offerings, uh, all kinds of things. So, the tabernacle is the religious and political center of Israel. And that's why it's so, so important. But it begs the question, what does it mean for us? Right? Okay? Because um, we have this guy named Jesus who, 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 who ran around during first, first century Palestine and kind of just overturned, every, overturned everything. Um, most importantly, though, we have to understand that the tabernacle also anticipates Christ. Okay. The tabernacle was this so there was this political and religious centerpiece for Israel, but it also anticipated Jesus Christ. And there are two places in particular where this becomes very very clear. Hebrews chapter 9 is the first one. Okay? I'm not going to read Hebrews chapter 9 because it's 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 lengthy and it's and it's rather complicated, but you can read it on your own but just right off there Hebrews chapter 9 is the chapter where it talks about how Christ, through his death, through, uh, through his life, through his resurrection, and th or through his life, death, and resurrection, 
fulfills um, where the tabernacle fell short. Because one of the things the writer of Hebrew does is he talks about how the tabernacle and the temple, this earthly manifestation, really is kind of a symbol of what's going on in heaven. And because it's merely a symbol, it's not going to ultimately do the, uh, it's not going to do completely what it needs to do. Christ comes down and fulfills everything and kind of fills in the gaps and allows the temple uh, and, and it kind of fulfills the things where the temple couldn't. Um, so that's, that's the first place where we talk about the temple anticipating Christ. The temple is the symbol of everything in heaven and by Christ coming down and living and dying and becoming resurrected, he fulfills everything to where that sketch is no, that, that, that symbol, that earthly symbol is no longer needed. The other place is John chapter 1. Okay? John chapter 1 is, is John's introduction to the gospel according to John. And um, I'm going to read just a couple verses out of that. And I'm going to highlight a particular word. Some of you guys probably already know this, but just in case you don't. Okay, so in John chapter 1, it talks about the word becoming flesh. Uh, so it starts off, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him no, no thing has come into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. That's gibberish. That's hard to follow. But reading on, the Gospel writer says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe in him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. John the Baptist was not the light, but bore testimony to the light. Jesus is the light. Jesus is this word that has become flesh. Jesus is this, Jesus is this thing that was there from the very beginning, through whom all has come, through, come into creation. And then moving on, he was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came, he came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. Again, speaking of Jesus and Israel's rejection of Jesus. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And here it is, John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh... And lived among us. We have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. And he goes on. Circle the word lived among us. That Greek word is used throughout the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, talking about the establishment of the tabernacle. Very, very literally, very, very literally. That phrase, he lived among us, is he tabernacled among us. John chapter 1 makes a linguistic connection. This isn't symbols. Okay? This isn't, this isn't, you know, this isn't what the writer of Hebrew does. The writer of Hebrew makes his argument through symbolism. John makes his argument through a linguistic connection and says. The Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. He is intentionally drawing your mind back to that thing that they set up in the middle of the world. <laughs> Just as that thing signified the presence of God Almighty living amongst Israel in a tent complex, Jesus' incarnation, becoming flesh, becoming man, to live amongst Israel, quite literally as you and I live amongst each other, that is the fulfillment, the next level, if you will, of that tabernacle and everything associated with it. So God no longer is confined to a building. God now is man, literally, walking amongst Israel. So that probably, in my opinion, is the quintessential reason why the tabernacle is important. John chapter 1, verse 14. John says that that thing anticipated Jesus so much so that Jesus is the quite literally flesh and blood fulfillment of that concept.
So what was symbolized in the tabernacle was taken to a different level in Christ. Quite literally, flesh and, flesh and bones walking amongst us. Okay? That same writer, the Gospel of John, that same writer is going to, in a few chapters later, talk about how Jesus needs to leave, ascend into heaven, so that in turn, an advocate can come and comfort his people. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. Okay? You can read about that in John chapter 16. That's a lengthy chapter. Um, that's a heavy chapter, so you can read it on your own. But that chapter is talking about Jesus. He's talking to his disciples. One of the last conversations he'll have before he goes to the cross. And he's going to sit there and he's going to say, I need to leave you. Yes, I am God, flesh and blood, standing right before you. But I actually need to leave you. And it's going to be more beneficial that I leave you. Because what I'm going to send after me is going to comfort you and is going to do things within you. And it's going to be beyond anything you could ever imagine. So that same writer who talked about the incarnation of God Almighty in the person of Jesus being the fulfillment of the tabernacle is also going to link it to God's presence living inside of us. And that, that concept, tabernacle, Jesus, Holy Spirit, God's presence on the world in a building, God's presence in the world in a man, God's presence inside you through the Holy Spirit. That trajectory, that continuum, is going to allow us to look at the final verses of Exodus and gain some, gain some, 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 some ideas on how we can apply this to our lives. So let's flip to Exodus, last chapter, chapter 40. And this is how, this is how I'm going to wrap it up. Exodus chapter 40, I think beginning at verse 34. Let's have somebody read verse 34 through 38. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle, because the cloud had settled down over it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey following it. But if the cloud did not rise, they remained where they were until it lifted. The cloud of the Lord hovered over the tabernacle during the day, and at night fire glowed inside the cloud so the whole family of Israel could see it. This continued throughout all their journeys. Without that continuum, the way the book of Exodus ends, quite frankly, is just a story. Okay? Without Jesus becoming incarnate, being, being the very presence, and without that Holy Spirit indwelling inside of us, these final verses is quite merely just the end of the story. How the people would sit there and they would just kind of, they would, they would set up camp, the glory of the Lord would come down and they would just kind of, they'd wait until the next phase of their journey and then when the glory would kind of ascend and the cloud would start moving, they'd pack up and they'd go from place to place. But because of Christ, because of the Holy Spirit, remember the Holy Spirit, God Almighty dwelling inside you, the presence of God inside you, not just in a man, inside you, John chapter 16. Um, we can kind of make these final statements our own. And this is, this is how, this is how I, I offer them to you. Um, Israel's journey was guided, uh, in the Exodus, the wilderness wandering, was guided by the very presence of the Lord. It says it right here. They would, they would make camp, and they would wait. And when the glory of the Lord would depart, they would break camp, and they would follow the glory of the Lord. They would follow the presence of the Lord. So their journey was very much dictated by the presence of God ascending and descending and leading them through the wilderness. Okay? Um, they know where they needed to go, um, but this entire journey, as we read through the rest of the Pentateuch, it wasn't something that came to fruition right after that. Okay? They went through years and years and years of wandering. It was a very, very lengthy process. Think journey, life process, life experiences. Just as we go through journeys in our life that are never done like that, and they're all a process, same thing happened to Israel. The people were responsive. Again, verses 36 and 37. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was taken up. The people were responsive to the presence of God on their journey. They didn't dictate the terms. 
They didn't say, okay, God, we're ready to go. Pack up, we're ready to go. No, that initial movement was always started by God Almighty. They responded to God along that journey. That cloud, that, that cloud and that pillar of fire was the constant reminder of their God and their goal. We also have to remember that. So as they're following this cloud, as they're following this pillar of fire by night, they are constantly being reminded of who their God is. Because remember, their God doesn't just stand in the heavens. Okay? Their God dwells among them. Their God lives in this house that they're carrying around on their backs and on their shoulders. And so when that cloud, that cloud is constantly there and it's constantly reminding them of who he is and their goal. Remember, their goal is the promised land. Their goal is not to wander aimlessly for the rest of their lives in the wilderness. I mean, unfortunately, it becomes that way for the first generation because of their own stupidity. But that's not their, that's not their goal. Their goal is the promised land. That's where they want to go. And it was up to them to follow. So, this is kind of what I offered, and we can kind of stew over this. Where do we take our cues? From who do we take our cues in our journey in our life in our journey that we call life? Seriously, just stop and think about that. How do we determine the next phase in our life? Is it more about what we think we want to do? Or is it more about responding to the Lord's leading? Because Israel, at the end of Exodus, Exodus is telling you this is what they did. Okay? As God kind of made the initial movement, it was up to them to follow. And they followed God. Okay? Serious question. Do we just plow our way forward? Or do we allow the presence of God? Remember that presence of God that lives inside of us now. Do we allow that thing to dictate? Or do we just, you know what, just lower your shoulder, you know, just... just Plow on through. Make your own way in life, as they say. You can do it. Just believe. I mean, is that, and seriously, is that the attitude we need to have? Because stated in those just generic terms, no, it's not the attitude that we just need to have. I, 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 don't, I don't think that's biblical. I mean, yes, there will be times in our lives where our faith will be tested, and we will kind of have to, you know, figuratively lower our shoulder and get through it. But this is not about, this. Sta that statement does not apply to us kind of, you know, just making our own way in life. We have to be sensitive to God. We have to be sensitive to His very presence living inside of us. And do we allow God to take us through the process? Because the exodus was a process. The wilderness was a process. It wasn't completed like that. But are we willing to follow those stages? Are we willing to kind of go through a stage get to the end of that stage and just be patient? Or are we just rushing things? We're constantly rushing things. So, that's where I want to leave you. We can talk about it. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very interesting picture that closes the book of Exodus. Don't ever forget that the picture, those final verses, is Israel responding and, and kind of going through that entire process really responding to God's initial movements, because that's what they did. God would move, and they would follow. And, um, and that whole process allows us to understand things. And kind of, so it's, it's a kind of a neat, interesting way. It's, it's, very, it's very much kind of a cliffhanger. I mean, because, you know, they're, they're going through place to place on their journey, but when we're done with the book of Exodus, we really have no resolution. They're not to the promised land yet. Doesn't seem like they're anywhere close, really. All we know is they finally built this tabernacle, they, they, they spent the last half of the book doing it. They finally got it done. And now the book climaxes with God Almighty's presence living among them in this, in this, in this, in this building. Um, and so they go from there and they dictate. So it's an interesting way to kind of think about things and ask yourself. So questions, comments? It seems like they really had a... <clears throat> were clued into the presence of God because he was, like you said, dwelling among them. Mm -hmm. Whereas we don't necessarily have that in our world like the cloud they had. Mm -hmm. No, we have the Holy Spirit in us. But um, I, I talked about this a little bit in my lesson today is we always 
you know, when we, we follow Christ and we pray and we want to do His will and we pray for a calling or pray for direction and then we get that calling and our immediate response is to either, ah, I can't do it, I got too much going on, that, that's not why, or, well, I, you know what, I'm going to pray about that thing about that. Pray about some more, figure out some more. Uh, yeah, I want to pray about, you know, God, you called me to this, I'm going to seek your answer on it. Mm -hmm. Like, God calls you and then you want your second opinion, right. but you want it because you want to do what you're taught and what the Lord says it is. You want to do the spiritual thing. You want to do the spiritual thing, you get your second opinion from, who are you getting your second opinion from? You're getting it from God. The same source. <laughs> so, why do we ask for that? Yeah. And, and, it's, and it is an interesting, you know, it's, it's, I know what you're thinking, because you know, back back when Israel, they had a temple, they had a tower, and, and, and it's a different sense that you get. It, it just is. I mean, you know, the reality is, and, and Christ was very clear about this, and it's all over John. You know, it, 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 it begins in John, and then it's taken up again in John chapter 4 with the Samaritan, the woman at the well, yeah. where, where Jesus basically looks at her and says, it's not about whose temple is right. It's going to be about something totally different, and it's going to revolutionize mm -hmm. the way you think about how I dwell in your life. And then when we get to John chapter 16, again, same, same book. You get to John chapter 16, he's talking about this advocate, this thing that's going to somehow dwell. In, it's really bizarre. It, it's, really, it's really bizarre, but that's where it's taking you, and it, and it creates an entirely different dynamic. And that's why... That's why the Christian community, in my opinion, becomes so important. Because what seems to be something that can be completely subjective, because it's me trying to interpret God, what He tells me, that can become very, very subjective and very, very dangerous. And that's why a whole different dynamic is created when that happens, and that's why the community, that's why good friends, that's why good fellowship becomes so important. Because those are the discerning ears that can say, okay, tell me what you're feeling. Tell me what you sense. Okay, okay. That's not scriptural. What do you mean it's not? Well, think about it this way. Oh, you know what? You're probably right. You know, or, you know, I think God's calling me to do this way. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, and yeah, let's talk about it. And then as time goes on, that initial feeling that you have, that initial inclination, mm -hmm. becomes reinforced. But you're right. It, it's a totally different thing. Um, but it's a dynamic that's, that's what we have and, and that's what Christ has, has decided to give us um, so it's really interesting I mean what do you I mean really what do you do with the tabernacle you read all about the tabernacle you read all about the temple but what is its use that's, ultimately that's what New Testament Christians have to come to grips with how do we apply those passages that talk about the tabernacle that talk about the temple what are we supposed to do with it what are we supposed to do with these things? And the groundwork's there. It's in places like John. It's in places like Hebrew, Hebrews. But the reality is, is that Christ has totally revolutionized things. And it's still applicable. You can still apply it to your life. It's just done so in a radically different way that you really have to stop and think about. Where it takes the whole concept of when you think about it in modern terms, you think about well, what this was in BC times. Yeah. That we see what the tabernacle was. Mm -hmm. We see that's where God was, and I, you know, it's like mm -hmm. a, people can you mm -hmm. can grasp that. Yeah. It's it's a visual concept you can grasp. So how does it apply in 2015? Is the tabernacle? Oh well, that's the church. It's not. No, it's not, not really. all the church. Yeah. It's what's inside the church. Yeah. And it's what exits out the church in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit yeah. in the believers. Yeah. yeah. And that's what, yeah, and that's their trajectory. And that's why I said it's the tabernacle and then it's Jesus and then it's the Holy Spirit. Without that, yeah. without that trajectory, this that stuff makes no sense. Yeah. It, it becomes this it becomes this obstacle that you cannot navigate. And praise God for the writers of the New Testament who figured it out. Under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they realized Oh my goodness, this man literally is God flesh and blood. It's no longer God 
restricted to a building. <laughs> this, this God is now literally walking among us. He's not dwelling among us. He's walking among us. And then John realizes, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, I see what's going on now. And that very presence that used to be restricted to a tabernacle, which then was restricted in a man, now isn't restricted at all. It's in everybody once they confess belief. And it's, and it's for everybody. And that, that, that idea gives the believer an intimate connection with God Almighty that is just, quite frankly, it's, it's, it's just unfathomable. I mean, it's one of the... It, the Holy Spirit, as the third person of the Trinity, is one of the genuine mysteries of the Christian faith. That's the only way that I know how to wrap it up and put it on. But it's real, and it's there for all of us. And... You will learn new things about it each and every day, but you will go your entire lifetime and not get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. And that is a glorious thing, because that means you're going to learn something new each and every day. And the insights will never die. So, any other thoughts, comments? What time is it? Private rescue, Phil. Phil and Stephen. Phil and Stephen, oh yeah, he is. I'm done. Okay, that's all I got. Any, any comments, questions? And we're done with Exodus, so you guys can... <laughs>